Hello, good afternoon, and welcome to this current affairs lecture by Rapport Reflects in collaboration with the Faculty of Law and Fox. Um, today, we'll be concluding our four-part lecture, um, our four-part uh, series of lectures on the war in Ukraine, uh, at least for the time being. Um, and we'll be taking a look at the war from a legal perspective today, um, which we'll be doing with um, uh, legal scholar uh, Lise Gras. Um, who is an associate professor of international and European law at Rappert University. Um, she'll be giving a talk about half an hour, after which there'll be ample time uh, for your questions. Um, my name is Bram Teunissen. I am uh, a um, program developer at Rappert Reflects. And um, yeah, I think without further ado, uh, I can give the floor to Lisa Glas. So give her a warm welcome. Yeah, so when thinking of the war in Ukraine um, and also the, the Russian uh, involvement there, there's really one image that springs to my mind. And this is a picture that's, that was taken on the 16th of March of this year, clearly. And what you see is that in Strasbourg, in France, people are taking away the flag of Russia. And why is this the case? Well, because on the very same day, Russia got expelled from the Council of Europe. And this is probably a less well-known international organization than, for example, the UN or the EU, but it is of really great importance to the protection of human rights in Europe. And during this lecture, I will return uh, to this picture, but I would first like to tell you, well, basically, what we'll be doing uh, this half hour. Well, to kind of make you more familiar with international law, I will give you a crash course in international law lingo. And it's just a really, really short crash course, only encompasses four terms, so, so don't worry. Um, and I will then briefly also deal with two questions. The first one is, is the war legal? And is what is being done during the war legal? Well, even if you're not a lawyer, you may already guess the answer, right? So what do you think? No, everyone is nodding no. And therefore, the third question becomes of relevance, namely, what can be done? And this is what, I will, uh, what, what I'll deal with uh, most extensively. So the lingo, um, as, as part of this crash course, I would like to introduce four areas of international law to you, because I'll be using these terms throughout this lecture. And the first term is the use ad bellum. And we lawyers, for some reason, really like Latin, so that will also uh, return a couple of times. Um, and this is basically, perhaps it's not even an area of law, but really the, the rules dealing with, can a state start a war against another state? So that, that's really what this part of international law is about. The other area of law that I would like to discuss is international humanitarian law. At in, for international humanitarian law, the, the question is different. So regardless of whether the law is legal or illegal, IHL assumes that a war is going on. And what it aims at is limiting the effects of the war. And it does so mainly by uh, protecting people who are not taking an active part in a war, or, such as civilians, or who are no longer active in a war, such as uh, prisoners of, of war. So, and, and so it, it, it basically says that combatants, so an army, should distinguish between civilians and civilian objects on the one hand, which may in principle not be attacked, and milita the military and military objects. And in addition to that, IHL also limits the means of warfare. So this basically means that certain weapons can't be used. So for example, chemical weapons or uh, biological weapons. Um, and also that certain tactics of war which you may perhaps already see in Ukraine, such as um, uh, starving a civilian population, can also not be used. 
So whereas international human, uh, humanitarian law only applies during an armed conflict, a war, international human rights law has a much broader application. So that applies in times of peace, but also in times of war. And what human rights law does, and this is really the area of my expertise, so any questions <laughs> relating to this. Um, and the, uh, human rights law basically protects individuals against the state by giving them human rights. And a right that is really relevant for this lecture is, of course, and unfortunately, the right to life. And lastly, international criminal law basically also does what domestic criminal law does, namely, well, trying to hold individuals responsible for violations of international criminal law. And what kind of violations should you think of? Well, committing genocide, war crimes, crimes against humanity, or the crime of aggression. So this is really focused on, focuses on, on punishing individuals. Well, moving on to the first question, is the law legal? Well, you were already nodding uh, no, so I'm, I'm really dealing rather shortly with uh, this question. And this is, as I said, the, the use ad bellum, regulating whether a state can or can't start a war against another state. And in principle, there is no way that a state can start a war against another war, and that's prohibited by the UN Charter, Article 2 for the prohibition on the use of force. And there's only two widely accepted exceptions to this rule, which is self-defense. So Ukraine can start a counterattack against Russia because it's being attacked, but there's no way that Russia can claim self-defense because Ukraine wasn't attacking Russia. And the other option would be authorization by the UN Security Council, which was clearly not given in this case. So is the war legal? No, it's illegal under international law. And the interesting thing to, to notice here is that Putin and, and Russia more in general, they don't say that this rule is nonsense. So they do talk the, the, the language of international law. What they do is claiming that an exception applies. So it's not so much that they say international law doesn't apply. No, we're relying on, on, on one of the exceptions. So that is, well, perhaps sad, but perhaps also uh, helpful, because at least they're still using the language of international law. Moving on to my second question is what happens during the war legal? And for this purpose, we can look at both international humanitarian law, so basically the law that says that also wars have rules, and international human rights law. And well, when you read the newspaper, uh, and I also saw it on Volkskrant this morning, there's, there's many um, articles saying, well, that there is quite some ev evidence that, for example, war crimes are being committed. And you see a picture of a hospital that got bombed, and according to the World Health Organization, at least last week, already 40, uh, no, 64 medical facilities had been attacked. Clearly, you can't uh, attack civilian objects, so this is, would be a, a, a war crime. Um, and in addition to that, um, there is also evidence that Russia is using cluster munition. And because of the, the, the widespread effect of this weapon, if you use it in an area where there's many civilians, you can't distinguish between civilians and combatants. And in that context, this would also be a, a war crime. And th th these are just two examples, right? Well, when talking about human rights law, I already said that the right of life is at stake, amongst many other rights, but this is, of course, the, the, I would say the, one of the most important rights, and also the ones that, that gets violated rather badly. So yes, there's violations of, of both areas of law, meaning that we can also answer this question by saying no, what is going on uh, during the war is not legal. So knowing that 
neither the war is legal nor what is being done during the war is legal, the question arises, what can be done? And I will discuss this question by um, looking at four courts, amongst which one future court. Um, and I've made this choice because I think I find this most interesting, but I want to emphasize that this is just part of the story, right? There's many more international bodies, think also of the, the EU or the UN General Assembly, that are concerned uh, with the war. But I will focus on international courts. And the question that will then pop up time and again is, do these courts have jurisdiction? Do they have the power to adopt a judgment um, in relation to the dispute or the war that we're looking at right now. And the first court that probably springs to mind is the International Court of Justice, which you see a picture over there. Do you know where, where this picture was taken? The Hague, right? So this is the Peace Palace. So this is one of the two courts that actually, that, that you can visit in, uh, in the Netherlands. What the ICJ does is it deals with state cases. So it's a state that can bring a case against another state. I'm always using as a lawyer the word state, but it basically means a country. Um, and, and states can bring cases because when they, they, they are in dispute about how international law should be interpreted or whether the other state has violated international law. And immediately moving to the question of jurisdiction, the problem is that Russia hasn't accepted the court's compulsory jurisdiction. And therefore, Ukraine can't bring a case before the court. Unless, and here we go again, there's, there's an exception again, unless there is a treaty to which both Ukraine and Russia is a party, and that says that any dispute about the interpretation of the treaty should be brought to the International Court of Justice. So basically what the Ukrainian lawyers had to do um, is look for a treaty that is, of course, of some relevance to the conflict and look at all the different articles and see whether one of the articles says, well, if you're in dispute about the application or interpretation of this treaty, you can bring a case before the International Court of Justice. And they managed to find such a treaty. Does anyone know which tr treaty Ukraine is relying? Yes? Yeah, so the, 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 the Genocide Convention. Yes, indeed. And, and you may wonder, well, what is the argument then? Well, Ukraine says that Russia is um, accusing it falsely of genocide and also is using this claim as a pretext for the invasion. And Ukraine then says, well, we have a right not to be uh, subjected to such a full claim, false claim, and we also have the right not to be invaded based on this claim. And, well, the question is, of course, will the ICJ accept jurisdiction on this basis? We don't know. I mean, there is no judgment yet. But what the ICJ has done is um, ordering measures, provisional measures. Uh, so basically saying, well, we're not adapting, uh, adopting a judgment yet, but in the meantime, we want to make sure that the situation doesn't get worse. So what did it require of Russia? Well, to suspend the military operations, and it also ordered uh, Ukraine and Russia to refrain from any action which may aggravate the situation. Well, of course, Russia hasn't listened, but this may give you an indication that perhaps the court has jurisdiction in this case. Because if, if, if it would be a complete nonsense argument, the, 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 the argument that the Ukrainian lawyers have come up with, it wouldn't say that it um, could order these provisional measures. So what if the court would adopt a judgment? What can it do? Well. It, it can basically repeat the order that it already made, uh, also ask Russia to pay Ukraine compensation and um, to, to promise, asking Russia to promise not to uh, commit the same violations again. And so I'm a lawyer, right? So this is the legal story. 
This is what can be done in a judgment. The question for many others will, of course, be, will Russia listen to any, well, to this court or to any other international court? Well, and for this court, it's and also the others. Unfortunately, it's doubtful because Russia has already um, is not taking part in the in the hearings before this court. Um, it has already refused to follow up to the order given by the court, and it also already said that it doesn't think that the court has jurisdiction. So these are, of course, not very hopeful um, prospects. Another international court that you can find in The Hague is the ICC, so the International Criminal Court, which is, of course, applying international criminal law. So before this court, actually individuals can be brought and then need to stand trial for uh, violations of international criminal law. And as I already said, it's rather clear, for example, that war crimes are being committed. So you, at least in theory, Russians or others committing these war crimes could be held to account before the ICC. The problem here is that neither Russia nor Ukraine are a party to the Rome Statute establishing the court. So they're not a party to this court. But the good news is that in 2014, Ukraine accepted the court's jurisdiction indefinitely for well, stuff that, is, of course, is going on on its territory. And in response to the, the recent war, um, 39 states parties have also referred ca this case to the ICC's attention. So there's um, 39 states parties that have asked the prosecutor of the ICC to start a case or to at least start investigating. And this was already being done in response to the events that happened before this war. But th this, this combination of the, the states referral and Ukraine saying, well, we accept the jurisdiction of the court, will give the court jurisdiction. So this is, again, it, it's kind of complicated, but this problem of jurisdiction gets solved in the end. And the good news is that this would mean that anyone committing crimes on the territory of Ukraine could stand trial before the ICC. So regardless of whether this person is Russian or, or Ukrainian or any other nationality. And what can happen at the end of a usually rather lengthy uh, legal process is that someone is put in prison, is given a prison sentence. And you may wonder, well, will this mean that Putin, or one of the persons really close to Putin, or someone really high up in the army, will one day stand trial before the ICC? Well, there's two problems here. The first is a legal problem, and that is the fact that Putin is a political leader. He's not involved in any of the acts that are being committed on the ground. And therefore, it's, it's hard to really link him to any of the crimes committed there, any of the war crimes or the crimes uh, against humanity. And it was also tried in 2019 to, um, to get uh, the, the former president of Ivory Coast, Gubago, um, he, he went to the ICC, but he got um, acquitted because simply the ICC couldn't um, find enough evidence or the prosecutor hadn't presented the court with enough evidence. So this makes you wonder whether this will be the case for Putin. A practical problem is that this court will only deal or really start a case uh, will, will impose a prison sentence on someone who is present in The Hague. And clearly, if there's no regime change, Russia is not going to uh, surrender Putin. So, well, chances aren't really high because of this legal and because of this, this practical problem that Putin will stand trial before the ICC. What can be done by the ICC is, you know, trying to, to get to put into is to issue an international arrest warrant. And that means that the 123 states that are a party to the ICC 
need to arrest and surrender Putin when he travels to their territory. And well, at, at least this will mean that the freedom of movement of Putin is decreased, but of course, well, he'll be smart enough not to travel to these territories. In a connection to the other point, also again talking about international criminal law, there are some, some high level people and, and also scholars arguing for the establishment of a special tribunal to make sure that uh, the crime of aggression committed by individuals is punished. And in principle, the ICC also has jurisdiction over this crime, but only if either the UN Security Council um, says it's okay to start a case, and well, <coughs> Russia has veto power, so that's not going to happen, or when both the perpetrator and the victim state are a party to the ICC, and that's also not a case. So you can't try this crime of aggression which is a violation of the prohibition of the use of force in Article 2.4 of the UN Charter, you can't try this crime before the ICC. And therefore, people have argued uh, and said, well, perhaps we should come up with a new criminal tribunal to punish this crime. Another reason for this is that it's actually easier to get Putin convicted for the crime of aggression than for any of the other crimes. Because the crime of aggression is a leadership crime, meaning that you need to be really high up in the government or in the military, uh, and you need to well, have some um, uh, control over decisions that are being taken there. And that's clearly the case for Putin. So it might be easier to convict him of the crime of aggression than of, of war crimes. And well, we, we don't have such a tribunal yet. It's just people arguing this and submitting declarations and, and writing blog posts uh, about this. But it could happen that, for example, the UN General Assembly recommends the establishment of such a tribunal and that it will then be uh, established together with Ukraine. But then we, of course, do need still an independent part of Ukraine um, after the war for this to happen. And the last court that I would like to discuss is the European Court of Human Rights, which is the, the court that is at, really at the core of my, my research interests. And, it's a, and, not, and, it's, and I find it really interesting to research this court because it's one of the only courts where individuals can directly bring a case against a state, meaning Ukrainians can, well, in theory, I'll get to the jurisdiction point later, can bring a case before the European Court of Human Rights to complain about the violations that Russia commits. And actually, this is something that happens a lot. So only last year, so just in one year, over 10,000 cases were brought before this court against Russia, mainly by, by Russians. And this is also why it's really bad news that Russia got expelled from the Council of Europe, because this court, the European Court of Human Rights, is part of the Council of Europe. And because Russia got expelled from the Council of Europe, it will also leave the European Court of Human Rights, meaning that ordinary Russians, who very often can't find justice in their own legal system, can no longer bring cases to this court. So moving back to the war, as I said, the first option would be that ordinary Ukrainians bring cases before this court. The problem is that states are usually only responsible for violations committed on their own territory. And luckily, Ukraine is not considered to be Russian territory yet. Um, so th that may complicate things. However, there's of course also an exception to this rule, and that is when a state has effective control over the territory of another state. And the court has, for example, said that Russia has effective control over um, Transnistria and Moldova. So this is maybe an argument that could fly. A counterindication is that the court once said 
in a case that was brought by Russia against, uh, no, by Georgia against Russia, that during the phase of active hostilities, so when there's actually a war going on, states can't have effective control. Because it's of course hard to effectively control a territory if you're still fighting for it. So this may be a counterindication for jurisdiction. However, just like the International Court of Justice, the European Court of Human Rights has also made orders asking Russia not to um, uh, attack civil civilians and also civilian objects. So this may perhaps be an indication that it will accept cases against Russia um, because of the war. So this is again the legal story. Um, what the European Court of Human Rights can do also as part of the legal story is ordering Russia to pay compensation to victims or asking Russia to pay compensation to Ukraine, who can then pay compensation to victims, because it's not, as the, the, you see on the pictures, it's not just individuals, but also states that can bring cases. Well, and then the question is, will Russia listen? And I don't think so, unfortunately. Um, Russia's track record is really bad when it comes to enforcing judgments of the European Court of Human Rights, and moreover, as I already told you two times, it has left the Council of Europe. So it's not even part of this organization anymore. So why bother listening to the court of this organization? My conclusion, what can be done? Well, I don't think a lot, and I think you were already aware of this, right? Uh, before the start of this lecture. So, the prohibition on the use of force hasn't stopped Russia from invading Ukraine. Also, obligations of international humanitarian law, of human rights law, haven't prevented the suffering of millions of Ukrainians. So, d these different areas of law, well, basically haven't stopped all this harm from being done. Um, in, in terms of legal procedures, there is some hope, because there is at least three courts that may have jurisdiction in one way or another, and there may be another court in the future, a special tribunal. Um, as I said, I'm telling you the legal story. So the question is, will Russia listen to these courts? Will it pay compensation? Um, will individuals actually stand trial before an international court? That's highly doubtful. And still, I would say, these courts and, and the proceedings before these courts can be of added value. Because they first of all lead to fact-finding, um, and also if there's at some point a re regime change in Russia, it may want to know the facts, and it's of course also very important for the victims to know the facts. And in addition to that, um, it's also simply recognition. Uh, so if a court adopts a judgment, an international court saying that certain violations have been committed either by Russia or Russians of international law, at least victims get some compensation, or some not compensation, recognition. And it's not a lot, but it's something. So I started my uh, lecture with people taking down the Russian flag, right? So this is really a picture that to me symbolizes Russia's relationship with international law right now. So it's, it's withdrawing, it's listening less and less to international rules. And to still end on a somewhat positive note, I wanted to show you a different picture. And this was a picture taken um, also in Strasbourg, I think, in 1974. And this was a ceremony by which Greece re-entered the Council of Europe. Because a couple of years before 1974, um, Greece left the Council of Europe, some days before it could get kicked out, uh, and, and that's what the, the, there was a decision of the leaders of the military junta. They said, we don't want to be subject to this international court anymore. But still, Greece, after a couple of years, rejoined the Council of Europe. So perhaps Russia may rejoin the Council of Europe after a couple of years as well, and even though 
Council of Europe, Europe membership doesn't equal respect for human rights per se, it at least means that a dialogue is going on between the state in question about its human rights obligations, and it also means that human rights are being reviewed, and most importantly, I think, that individuals can bring uh, claims of violations before the European Court of Human Rights. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for your yes. lecture. As I said, this concludes our series on the war in Ukraine for the time being. Uh, but if you want to uh, watch the recordings, you can find them on our website. Um, also, if you have any questions or, find, uh, or need to find resources on the way uh, the university is operating with regards to this conflict, you can visit um, these uh, addresses projected behind me. Uh, and there you can find some resources. Um, Lisa, thank you very much for your lecture, um, and thank you for attending, and hopefully we'll see you uh, at our next event. So give a warm applause.